Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are starting a new series this week, and as with any series that I do, I have no idea how long it will take. My plan is for about six weeks, which means we'll probably finish sometime in December. This so, what's that? This year? This year. Yes, this year. It's about women's Bible study. <laughs> Um, so we are going to be talking about money. Now, how many people in here have heard a message about money? Have been in church and actually heard somebody speak on money? Okay. And how many of you was that message based around giving and tithing? Okay. Unfortunately, that's almost all the church talks about concerning money. And, and this is an absolutely horrible approach to dealing with it. You know, Jesus spoke about money more than he spoke about heaven and hell combined. Did you know that? Did you know that 11 of the 39 parables that he gave dealt with the issue of money? Some biblical scholars say that there are in excess of 2,000, one scholar actually has the number up above 2,300 verses in the Bible dealing with the issue of money. Now, honestly, I can't attest to the accuracy of that. Some of the ones that I looked at, I started going down and see were very obvious. Some of them I went, mm, you could infer money, but I, I don't know that that's really what it's talking about. But the idea is that this is an important subject for us to know about. Okay? It's something that is significant. And, and the, the biggest reason why I believe this is important, why Jesus spent so much time talking about money, is because until God has your purse, there is another God buying for your attention and your time and your heart. Okay? And, and Jesus addressed this very pointedly when he said, a man cannot serve two masters. He will either love the one and despise the other, or vice versa. But then he, he follows it up with a very specific statement, saying you cannot love both God and money. Okay? Now, money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, we have twisted that around and said money is the root of evil or lots of evil or all kinds of evil, but that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay? So, we're going to start looking at this, and we're going to kind of break it down into a, a number of phases. But the, the first thing that I want to do today is we have to start off before we ever get into talking about money because everybody has an idea how money should be used, right? Even if your idea is bad, we all have ideas, okay? We all have things that we think are worthy of our money, right? Oh, come on. Yeah. There were like three people that had a plan for money. All the rest of you are liars. Okay? If somebody were to walk up to you and give you $50 right here, how hard would it be for you to find somewhere to spend that $50? Not hard. Okay? <clears throat> Actually, my wallet is the safest place for money to be in our house. <laughs> because I never keep money in my wallet. I always keep it in my pocket. <clears throat> So Christy will stash money in my wallet because I don't know it's there. And then when she needs money, she just gets it right back out of my wallet. And I don't, I'm none the wiser, so it doesn't matter. But, you know, if you guys need to stash some money, ask Christy for my wallet. Um, so, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 6. While you guys were turning there, I was thinking, so give me a minute to catch up to you. 
<clears throat> in this uh, chapter, in this section of chapter 6, Paul is writing to Timothy and he's warning him against um, false teachers. Okay? So, in order to understand this in context, you got to back up and see where it comes from. But I'm only going to read part of it because I've got a lot of notes for today. I want to try and get through all of them today because I don't want this message broken up into multiple pieces. Okay? So, I'm going to pick up in verse 6. I would encourage you back up and read prior to. Just like always, don't ever take what I start as as the beginning. Okay? I'm, I'm pressed for time. In your time, read what it all says. All right? So starting in verse 6. But, and see, that's why you got to read before, because but, why is the but there? Okay? But godliness with contentment is great gain. Do I have your attention? Write that down. <laughs> I'll wait. Highlight it, underline it, write it in your notes. Make some form of getting this in your brain. <clears throat> First Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, I want to share with you first, uh, a great part of where I got this was from a series that James McDonald spoke on a number of years ago. And I was so impressed with the idea that he, he was able to spend five or six messages speaking about money and only one time in all of that that he addressed giving to the church. And it really opened my eyes to how poorly the church has dealt with scripture regarding this. Now, I've taken James McDonald's message uh, series. I've gone and I've, I've cross-referenced with other people. I've, I've looked with uh, Dave Ramsey. We will be starting another Dave Ramsey class this fall. Heads up, Nathan. Um, I think it's very important that you control your money rather than the money controlling you. Um, I also looked way back to uh, Larry Burkett. I also looked at some other uh, messages. I also just stuff from my own studies. So there's, there's a portion of this. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go out to James McDonald's website, Walk in the Word, and, and listen to his take on this. I'm altering this because there are some areas where he says things that I disagree with. Okay? And, and so you're getting my take on this. All right? So godliness with contentment is great gain. And he goes on to explain in verse 7, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Hmm. Yeah. I have a fan. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now here's that verse I just quoted. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Okay? Now... <clears throat> This, this passage right here could be an entire message unto itself. Uh, I, I'm not going to take the time to do that, but I want you guys to spend some time in this because this passage has roots that weave all throughout the Old and the New Testament connecting the idea of money together. Okay? Um, so first, let me say that money is not bad. Neither is money good? Okay? Money is just a thing. Okay? It's just a thing. It's neutral. It's your heart toward money that makes the outcome either good or bad. Acts chapter 13, uh, keep your finger there because we're going to kind of 
keep referring back to there. Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 13, verse 37 says, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. This is uh, in Peter's speech. He's speaking of the resurrection of, Je I'm sorry, Paul's speech. He's speaking of the resurrection of Jesus. He says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, uh, forgiveness of sins may be proclaimed to you. And you know what? I put the wrong scripture down. <laughs> Give me just a sec. Okay, so keep going. 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man's forgiveness of sins uh, is proclaimed to you, and 39, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Okay? I want you to key on the phrase right here. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything. Okay? Because we're not under the law of Moses, are we? Okay? So, what the law of Moses couldn't free us from, Christ has freed us from. What is that? Everything. Now, who is this verse being applied to? By him, everyone who believes. So it's believers, right? Okay? We need to read scripture with our eyes wide open. Okay? Because a lot of times we miss important things like who is this addressed to? And we want to broad brush things. Okay? And sometimes it is broad brush, but some other times it's very specific. Okay? So if you are a believer, he has freed you from everything. Now, sociologists say that there are three issues that tend to be a stumbling block for people. Okay? It's interestingly enough, two of the three are the same as two of the three top issues that couples struggle with. Okay? The, the three biggest entanglements, according to sociologists, are money, sex, and power. The three greatest conflicts in marriage, most often conflicts in marriage, are money, sex, and communication. Which, quite honestly, I think it's the communication that causes problems with the other two. But money, obviously, these are people that are not godly people that are coming up with these statistics. Money, obviously, is a problem. It's a concern. It's an issue that people have to deal with. Um, in America, how much money is enough? A little more. Just a little more. We, we have this idea that if I could just have a little bit more money, everything would be all right. Well, what happens when we get a little bit more money? We spend more. And so our spending always exceeds our income. We're always needing just a little bit more. Um, just some statistics for you. The average American family owes in excess of $130,000. Let's take the mortgage out of that. Drops the number down to about $40,000. Okay, this is the average. All right. Um, we reduce this by removing the automobile loan, school loans. The average American has between five and seven thousand dollars of what is called consumer debt, credit cards, personal loans, things of that type. Now, right there, five to seven thousand dollars doesn't sound like that much, but if we take away the number of people that owe zero consumer debt, that number jumps from between five and seven thousand dollars to an excess of fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand dollars. See, one of the great lies propagated in the business of money 
is that money gives you freedom. And if you don't have money, you can get credit, which will purchase you freedom. It gives you the flexibility to do what you want. But what does the scripture say about things like credit cards and personal loans? So not, it's not freedom, is it? Matter of fact, in Proverbs, it says uh, that the borrower is a slave to the lender. So God looks at loans, whether it be credit card, personal loan, or whatever. He doesn't look at that as freedom. He looks at that as enslavement. Okay? So we have an issue... And by the way, the number does not change significantly from those outside the church to those inside the church. Okay? So, so this is an area that obviously the church in America is struggling with. If any of you would like to look at my notes after, please let me know. I'll get you a copy of them. Uh, in order to understand how God wants us to view money, we must understand whose it is. Okay? This is significant. Because this is where we widely separate ourselves from Scripture. Whose is it? Okay? We say that here, but do we live that well, I would pull out my wallet, but my wife has my wallet. <laughs> there might even be money. Here. <laughs> Do we live like we believe what we say? I want to read a passage to you. Um, this is from the life of David. This is out of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Um, this is the point where David has... Uh, he's talked to Solomon about the temple that, that God has shown him to, that he's to build. Uh, you realize that when Solomon built the temple, it was all according to the plans God had given David. And that David bequeathed under the building of the temple a huge amount of resources. And he's even gone so far as to go out to the elders of all the tribes of Israel and say, Hey, look, we're building a house for God. Cough it up. Okay? And there, there's millions of dollars being set aside for the building of this temple. But I want to read to you what David has to say about this. He's praying, and I'm going to pick up in verse 10. So this is 1 Chronicles chapter 29. He says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. I'm going to reread that. All that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Now, I don't know what your personal financial status is. But I think it's a safe bet to say that David has had more than you have. Pretty safe. Pretty safe. Okay? Um, and yet here he is, a man who put thousands of talents of gold and silver to the building of God's temple. Okay? And he's saying, everything in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to thus offer willingly for all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. Do you understand what he's saying there? This offering, God, that we're presenting to you, it all came from you. It's yours. You gave it to us. 
and we're returning it to you. Okay? So let's, let's keep reading. Um, For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding, O Lord, our God. All this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. And is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. Now, this right here reveals David's heart. And I think this is why he was a man after God's own heart. Because David knew the source. He knew where it all came from. And he's stating right there before God and everybody, all the people that are gathered, God, what we are giving to you is already yours. You have given it to us and we're turning around and returning to you what is yours. Okay, All that we have, even those parts we didn't keep, those are yours too. Okay, So, David is living out the idea that everything is God's. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So, somebody here explain to me what of all that we see around us is not God's. Well, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I'm not God's. <laughs> so you think and so you're deceived. Because on that day, it says, every knee will bow. And every tongue will acknowledge the truth. They will confess. What does confess mean? To agree with God that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's not Jesus Christ has become or will become. He is. And ever was and ever will be Lord. Okay? So, if all of it is His, even up unto you, what is not His? Nothing. Okay? So, in order to understand the principles that Scripture are laying out for how to deal with money, we have to understand it's not ours. Okay? When I was little, we used to have what was called the farmer's market. It was not like the farmer's market you guys have around here. It was a building. And the farmers would come and they would drop their produce off and their milk and whatever. And it was, it was just, it sat right behind the gas station. And sometimes mom would give us some money and say, I need you to go to the farmer's market and I need you to pick up whatever. Okay? And, and those devious, hateful people would always put the candy before whatever it was we needed to get. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to the store, I'm getting cabbage, I'm getting cabbage, it's Bubba Joe. <laughs> Bubba Bubba. And it, that was horrible. <laughs> Whose money was I spending? It wasn't mine. And if I came home with a bunch of Bazooka Joe, I don't think she would appreciate the comics. Does anybody here know what Bazooka Joe is? Okay. All right. I get worried sometimes. Okay. But we were expected to go and to get what was required and to bring a receipt and give an accurate account of the money. And an accurate account was not telling her, yeah, I blew it all on Bazooka Joe. That was not a good thing. Okay. So, when we are walking through this life, everything that comes into our life, financially, is from God. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to address to you. Wow. I'm on page two of four. <laughs> Backing up. <laughs> If that was God, I didn't understand. <laughs> okay. 
In David's prayer, he says, I know, my God, that you test the heart. One of the things that God tests the heart with is money. Okay? How does God test us with money? I'm going to list off a series of questions here and, and kind of explain them to you. Money is a test of your work ethic. Dave Ramsey says that if you look at your finances like um, a log float, you know, when they used to cut them and float them down the river. If your finances are in a mess, you've got a log jam. Now, in order to clear the log jam, you have to do one of two things. You have to remove the logs or you must increase the flow. Okay? And the way he applies this to money is when you are in a financial bind, you have to either remove the debt or increase the income. Okay? So looking at finances, if you are in a financial bind, one of the first things you have to look at is, are you working? Are you working enough? Should you, could you be working more? Are you working a part-time job and living a full-time life? <laughs> so, test number one. Your work ethic. Are you willing to work? Number two. It's a test of your self-control. Do you have the control when you have a part-time income to live a part-time life? Do you have the control to say, no, I don't need Dish Network and 746 useless channels <laughs> because I can't afford that. Are you willing to say, you know what, I'm eating chicken because I can't afford steak? Or if some of you were like some of us in our previous years, you're eating noodles because you can't afford chicken. The only chicken you got to know was the chicken flavoring that went on your noodles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share a story from my life when we were in a very desperate place. Um, we had, was it macaroni and cheese? We got a million boxes of macaroni and cheese. When, when you guys give to the food pantry, <laughs> Variety. <laughs> okay? I was so sick of macaroni and cheese. Oh. And I prayed and I complained to God, God. It's mac and it's not even manna. It's just mac and cheese. <laughs> and God blessed us with a whole case of tuna fish. <laughs> And so we ate tuna fish with our mac and cheese till the mac and cheese ran out, then we just ate tuna. But I didn't complain. Because the next thing you know, he's going to be giving us onions. Canned peas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a test of your self-control. Are you willing to spend under your income? Number three. It's a test of your love for people. Do you give when it's not advantageous to you? Do you give without claiming it on your taxes so you can get a write-off? Do you give without doing it in public so people will applaud you? Golfa, golfa. What a useless sport. <laughs> Man, if you can't just clap and cheer and shout, I don't want it. You've offended me three times already. <laughs> I'm getting ready to talk about the Broncos. <laughs> Poor Scott wasn't here last week when I forgot the Broncos won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and neither was Dennis. That was God. <laughs> it's a test of your 
integrity. How did you come by what you had? Did you cut corners? Did you do things under the table so you wouldn't have to pay taxes? Have you rendered unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Have you given unto God what is God's? It's a test of your integrity. Okay? I'll tell you, one of those things that, that are just really gets under my skin is people that manipulate and use the Christian fish. I have no problem, man. I, I applaud you. If you're a Christian and you have a business and you put the fish on there, represent Christ. Don't be slothful. Don't do second-rate work. Give an honest price. Do honest work. Because I'll tell you, some people put that up there and then they take advantage of people because they're Christians. What, what a crock, man. They stand before God judged. It's a test of your integrity. And finally, it is a test of your love for God. Do you love God more than you love the money? Do you love God enough when He tells you, okay, I know that 47 cents is all you have to your name, but I want you to put it in the offering this week. God, I, I got 47 cents to pay all the month's bills, to buy food for my family, to put gas in my car so I can get to work. I have 47 cents. Put it in the offering. You know you have a good spouse when you turn to your wife and say, put the money in the offering, and she doesn't question you, she just takes it out and puts it in. And thus began a spree of macaroni and cheese and tuna. <laughs> because he was faithful. Scripture says, I've never seen a righteous man's children begging bread. Didn't say they were going to eat caviar and shrimp and lobster and steak but their needs were met. Now, I want to wrap up. I'm going to have to continue a little bit of this next week, but I want to compare two men who were tested by money. Both of them in the time period of the Passion. Okay? The first one, Judas Iscariot. Uh, does anybody know what Iscariot means? Iscariot is, is a transliteration of Ish Kiriath, meaning from the town or the place of Kiriath. Kiriath was a, a village about um, oh, some miles south of Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, it, Judas and his father Simon were called Iscariot. It just means Judas and Simon from this town. Okay. So there's nothing magical or mysterious about that name. It's just a transliteration. All right. So. Judas, what do we really know about Judas? Well, the first thing that should jump out to you is that every listing of the 12 disciples that Jesus called to be apostles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them list Judas last. Okay? And all three of them add this title. They append this title to him, who betrayed the Christ. Okay? So, um, is anybody in here familiar with the term a Benedict Arnold? Okay, what does that mean? Traitor. Traitor. He was so insignificant compared to Judas that, that it doesn't even bear thinking about. All right? Um, he was the keeper of the purse for those who follow Jesus. John chapter 13. He had another master besides Jesus. Did you know that? He was serving. He had divided loyalties. And when it came down to it, he chose whom he would serve. Now think about this for a minute. I, I talked about the scripture. Jesus says that... that you cannot serve two masters. This was at the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter 6. Guess who was listening? Judas. Judas was there. And I think in some way, while that could apply and, and should apply to all of us, I think at that point, 
Jesus was already trying to reveal to Judas what was in his heart. Judas, you have another master that you're serving. Because Scripture tells us that when, when Mary came and she poured the ointment on Jesus' feet and she, she blotted it with her hair, Judas was upset. What is this? I mean, look at this waste. We could have taken that, sold it, and given the money to the poor. To which scripture says, lie. Because he had no interest in giving money to the poor. What did he want the money for? Himself. you got to think about this. Why did he want money? I mean, think about this. He's following Jesus. Hey, what's for dinner? I don't know. What do we got? Bread and fish? Oh, look. More bread and fish. What did he lack? What did he get to spend it on? I mean, Jesus says that the, the foxes have owls on the ground and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Was he hanging out at the Hilton? I'll meet up with you guys in the morning. Where, where, where was the money going? He got a better fish? He was taking from the purse for himself. He was a thief. Okay? And when it came down to it, he viewed money horizontally. He looked at money as only what it could do for him. And see, I think a lot of us are more like Judas than we want to, to acknowledge. We want to see what money can do for us instead of viewing it vertically and acknowledging and understanding it's all his. See, this is one of those dangerous things that we really have not grasped a hold of because if we grasped a hold of it, I think we would all live our lives differently. See, Scripture calls us stewards. Stewards. And as stewards, well, well, does anybody, can somebody give me a definition of a steward? You're a caretaker. You're a manager. You're the one who looks after the master's stuff. Okay? As a matter of fact, several of the, the parables that Jesus told talk about this relationship. One of them, the parable of the talents, right? The master comes and he says, I'm going away on a long journey. Here, I'm going to give you a portion of my money. I'm going to give you a portion of my money and you a portion of my money. Take care of it. And he goes away. And when he comes back, what happens? The guy that had the three talents, or the five, depending on, on which story you're listening to, had doubled his money. And said, look, master, I, I, I have returned to you twice what you gave to me. How much did he keep for himself? How much did he keep for himself? You think he looked at that and said, here's your 10%? No, because it was all the master's. Well, then the next one comes up and he says, Master, you've given me two. And, and look, I have doubled. I, I give unto you four. And the master says, well done. How much did he keep? None. But see, then there's the steward who has given one. And he comes to the master and he says, look, I'm giving you back what's yours. Now, was the master happy with that sermon? No. Why? I mean, he gave him one, he got one back. Now, before you start answering that, I want you to look at your life, and I want you to evaluate what you're doing with the things that God has given you. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all of your income is supposed to go right back to the church. Okay? We are going to address tithes and offerings and alms at a point down the road. <coughs> We're going to talk about what Scripture has to say about those things. But let me tell you right now, uh, I'm not asking you for your money. I, I won't stand up here and ask for your money. Why? Because you're not the source. God is. And God has blessed this church. 
and of all the churches I've ever been in, where I've been affiliated in any role in leadership, this church is the most giving church I have ever been a part of. All that needs to be done is to make the need known, and people are jumping to meet it. And I speak that as an encouragement to you, that you, well done. Well done. Okay? Another parable that Jesus told is about the good steward and the bad steward, the faithful steward and the faithless steward. And the master goes away on a journey. <clears throat> and the faithful steward looks after all of the master's stuff. He's looking after the slaves. He's looking after the fields. He's taking care of it. When the master comes home, he finds the steward at work taking care of all of the business. And he comes home and he commends the faithful steward, the faithful servant. But the faithless one, after he realizes the master has been gone and there's no end in sight as to when the master comes home, he, what does he start to do? He starts to abuse the slaves. He starts to get drunk and, and start to take for himself the master's things. And when the master returns, that servant is cut up and thrown out. Ah, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? <clears throat> See, as stewards, we are called and are going to be responsible to give an account for everything that God has given us. And you go, well, that, that's kind of heavy. Well, you know, Scripture says we're going to give an account for every idle word. God is keeping track of it. Now, thank God this is not salvation. We give an account, and this is rewards. Okay? So, you know, some of us are going to get to heaven and receive great rewards, which we will then turn around and lay at his feet. Some of us will get to heaven and be glad we made it. But we will get nothing. But we will still bow at his feet. Okay? See, that's, that's the whole point of works, not to get you in. They, the, the works comes after you get in. It's something that God has done after salvation, not unto salvation. Okay? So Judas was misusing and abusing his place as the caretaker of the money. Now it's amazing because Judas kind of had a revelation, didn't he? So when he betrays Jesus, he betrays him with a kiss. How intimate and personal is that? No one can betray you but a friend. You know? You don't let your enemies close enough to betray you. But the friends, those are the ones that get in close. And he betrays the master with a kiss. And then, when he sees what the council has planned for Jesus, what does he do? He goes back to him and he says, I have betrayed innocent blood. Because he knew Jesus was innocent. And, and what did the leader say? What's that to us? It's not our problem. It's your problem. And he throws the money down on the ground before him and he goes away and he hangs himself. Alright? Now, because they were righteous men, they take the money and they say, well, this is blood money. We can't put it in the temple treasury. That would be wrong. <laughs> That was wrong. <laughs> do, you, do you see the hypocrisy there? But there's a second man. And, and I will wrap this up quickly. There was a second man. Joseph of Arimathea. Now Joseph of Arimathea, what do we know about him? Rich. We know he was rich. How do we know he was rich? He was rich because he had a new tomb that no one had ever been laid in before. Now, when we were in Israel, do you have the, the pictures that were put up there? I want you to put up uh, the first picture of the tomb. We got to see what a, a tomb would look like. And they, basically, they carved them out of rock, or they took a cave and, and shaped it, and they put a preparation table in where they would prepare the body, and then there was another table that they would lay the body on to rest, and the body would decay. Now, because there were more people than there were holes in the, in the rock. 
they had to reuse the tombs. <coughs> now this is the one that a lot of people believe that Jesus was laid in. Now you see the, the empty slot there looks kind of like a bathtub with the wall broken out. Okay, there would have been a table sitting there that the body would have been laid on. Okay? And as the body decayed, they would give it a period of time, and, and I've heard all kinds of estimates from a matter of like six months to several years. But when all that was left was the bones, one of two things would happen. Depending on the time period and the finances, if the person was in a hurry or didn't have a lot of money, the, the, the bones were taken and they were put in the middle of the room in a pile. Okay? We know about this from Elisha. Remember when Elisha died, they buried him, and, and then they were doing another funeral, and the enemy came, and they're like, quick, pitch him in the... And they threw the dead dude in with Elijah, Elisha, and the dead dude wasn't dead anymore. And you got to wonder what, what he thought when he woke up. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else is running off because the enemy's coming. I know, i got a weird brain. <laughs> but I think about things like that. And what would you do? Okay? But we also know when we were in Israel, we got to see what, what other method it would take. Go ahead and put the other one up. Wait, wasn't Joseph a, a, a member of the Sanhedrin? Yes, he was. We'll talk about that in just a minute. See these boxes here? Those are called ossuaries. Okay? They're bone boxes. They would take the bones and they would fit them into that box. And then the box would be put on a, on a shelf or off to the side. And, and the tombs, were they would serve generation after generation of family. And, and if you didn't have the money to be able to have all the fancy boxes, which obviously they did, then the bodies were just piled into the middle of the room. Okay? But Joseph had a new tomb. It had yet been used, which indicated that he had money to be able to have dug for himself a tomb. Okay? Now, Scripture also tells us that he was a secret follower of Jesus. And it's funny because the two men that come to, to take care of Jesus' body, one, it calls a secret follower of Jesus, and the other one says it's Nicodemus who came to visit Jesus in the nighttime. Why? Because they were afraid of the leadership. They were afraid of the Pharisees, of the Sanhedrin. Scripture also tells us that Joseph dissented, disagreed with the council's decision to kill Jesus. Okay? So here you have a man who is a secret follower of Jesus, and yet when he sees his Lord crucified, he musters up the moxie, the guts, to go to Pilate and say, I want the body. And you know all of those people that hated Jesus knew about it because when they heard the body was placed in a tomb, they went to Pilate and said, Oh, lest his disciples come and steal the body, they knew where that body was. So Joseph was making a statement not just with his money, but in the testimony of who he was following. And he was using his money as a testimony of what he believed in. So see, you can look at money like Judas as a test, which it is a test, and you have to be honest in your how you handle money. You have to be honest before God. He already knows. Don't, don't try to prevaricate. Don't try to dance around the bush. Be honest. God, I stink with money. I'm horrible with money. I'm selfish. I'm narrow-minded. I, I, I don't often consider your will, your will and your plans. I, I, help me with this, okay? Or you can be like Joseph of Arimathea who took his money and used it in service to what would honor God and would commend himself before God. All right. Everybody got written down that verse I told you to write down? What is it? What, what's the reference? 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. 
Godly with, godliness with contentment is great gain. We're going to touch on that. This is going to be a, a theme that is going to weave through all of the messages that I give over the next few weeks. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that we can serve you and that you can break the bonds that bind us. And I ask, Lord God, today that if there would be any here who are bound by that false God, mammon, Father, that you would set them free. Father, that you would deliver us from the, the twisted idea that it's ours. Father, that you would open our eyes to see just how greatly you have blessed us. And that, Father, we would not be frivolous with those things that you have given us. And I ask God over the next weeks as we, we study your word, Father, that you would continue to show us your plan, your desire for how we would view money, how we would use it, how we would uh, be free of its grip. And I ask your blessing, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.